Alright all you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 Podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, it really, 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 really helps us out. I know I say it every week, but it does not become less important on a weekly basis. While you're over there as well, if you could give us a review, that just helps us out even more. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show, and thank you so, 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 so much to anyone that's already done that for us. You are an absolute legend to us. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, Mr. Lewis Gamley. How's it going, Lewis? Not too bad at all, Mark. Good to see you as ever. How are you doing yourself? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. The good weather here in Scotland seems to have been fleeting and it is currently miserable outside. Yeah, it's been miserable for days now, hasn't it? It has. So looking out at a nice grey sky. Speaking of misery, Lewis, I hear you've still been playing The Last of Us. <laughs> Very good segue, Mike. What a segue. What a segue. <laughs> yeah, so I think we've essentially both just been playing The Last of Us. Yeah, part we two have, yeah. So I am now... I think about halfway through the game, it's hard to know with any certainty where you sit when you're trying to avoid any potential giveaway of any story beat. But I think that I'm more or less halfway, maybe just slightly over halfway through the game now, which is great. Yeah, I think you've you've overtaken me now, so I'm maybe about a third of the way through the game. I do get the feeling that this kind of first half is maybe bigger than the second half which might sound daft but it does <laughs> because it, it feels like this this section is quite stuffed with action and I, I wonder at what point we're going to get those slightly faster story beats where it'll jump through chapters more quickly but we'll see i mean i must have played 12 hours now at least maybe more than that yeah it feels like it's still got a ways to go so i've reached the point where i think i've seen most of what they showed us in advance now so everything from here on in is kind of all new and exciting stuff for me Awesome, man. Well, I know that last time we ended up speaking a lot about the sort of discourse around the game, and there was two reasons for that, really. One is because that was the conversation that was happening around The Last of Us 2 last week. And secondly, we hadn't really played it very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now we have. Now we've played it loads. So let's talk about the game, Lewis. Just so you know, we're going to go into a little bit of gameplay now. There might be some exceptionally mild spoilers in here, but in terms of story, we will spoil absolutely nothing. I do not want to spoil that <laughs> for anyone at all. So it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I'm finding it to be utterly astonishing, to be honest, Mark. I am having that experience where every night when I go to bed after playing it, every morning when I wake up, I'm thinking about it. Certain moments, not even the huge big story beats or any of that stuff, just the gameplay. It is a constant feeling in me right now that I want to get back to it. That's amazing. That's really, really cool. The gameplay itself, I think actually, I've kind of moved my position on that a wee bit. I think last week we were kind of talking about the fact that neither of us had felt that it had changed very much and I suppose in mechanical terms it probably hasn't however I'm feeling that the action in itself is way more frenetic than it was in the first game it's much more sort of duck and move than it is sit and hide do you know what I mean which I felt as if was far more prevalent in the first game and I think a lot of that's to do with the AI which is ruthless and hunting you down absolutely ruthless and then also in terms of stealth sections they have introduced guard dogs now which have the ability to effectively sniff you out and follow your scent so if you stay stuck in the one place for too long or you sit in the one place for too long then there's a good chance that a dog at some point will come and find you and then all hell breaks loose effectively that does end up meaning that you do have to kill quite a lot of dogs in this game which is quite sad (laughs) But as well with the with the zombie type enemies as well, they also introduce an enemy called a shambler and stalkers as well. I'm not super familiar with stalkers. I assume that they've come up more definitely, in your yeah. playthrough. I think that I've just met my first couple. But the shamblers anyway definitely force you to move or definitely force you to attack in a way that will attract attention because they have armor and you can't just stealth kill them. Do you know what I mean? So even though you might be able to take them down in a way that you are not immediately noticed, it will still make a noise and it will still rile the other enemies, which puts you in a lot of danger immediately. And I don't remember going through these processes in The Last of Us Part 1. I always felt as if I could mostly stealth my way through sections, either with the bow 
or just by kind of strategically stealth killing and taking my time going through sections whereas in part two it very much forces you into full combat situations way more yeah, often yeah certainly around that first encounter with the shambler it's very much like an arena fight almost i don't know if it's actually possible at all to maintain stealth at that point so yeah you, you're totally right that like they in certain ways they've evolved they've evolved even the zombies or the infected rather that were in the first game to behave in slightly different ways well all the yeah, ai's i think is just miles better particularly the human ai the, the human, human ai, AI amazing, and even the difference between the the way that each faction that you encounter in the game how those humans behave is slightly different it feels like i mean i don't know with any certainty to that but it feels like they have have slightly different tactics depending on who it is you're encountering i think yeah. it's so smart because most games just have you know everyone just behaves in the, exactly the same way yeah default totally. ai well ai is difficult to write so having only one probably saves exactly, quite a lot of time yeah. i would have thought <laughs> but you also mentioned stalkers there um, which i guess you probably haven't had too much of an experience with no not yet i haven't had very much experience so with i won't i won't say too much about that and to be fair i've only had a few encounters like they have been used relatively sparingly so far but my god the first time that i was sort of stuck in one big room with them i found that to be one of the most tense horrifying experiences the thing about, like with clickers is they'll just come and kill you you know if, if you fuck up and they can get their hands on you you're basically dead and you've kind of come to terms with that by this point yeah. but the thing about the stalkers is that they they've got what the game describes as like bestial intelligence so they behave semi-humanly and it is fucking too much <laughs> <laughs> i must admit even in my very limited encounters with them they have been horrifying <laughs> i've got to say they've been really really so this is like stealth zombies effectively but when they find you they are yeah. anything but stealthy they are absolutely <laughs> rabid <laughs> i suppose that kind of gets me on to my last point is that they're just kind of the general atmosphere around the game is incredibly incredibly tense incredibly tense almost all of the time except for these interspersed genuinely like beautiful moments whether it be between characters or whether it be something that they're being shown you on screen or w whatever it might happen to be or even if it's just a bit of downtime where things happen to not be going particularly great among the characters it, it still feel, it feels like such a release it's such a relief to get to mm -hmm. a section like that and i really think that those story moments in those sections between this immense tension really land like really really land and i don't know if it is because of the break in that tension that they land so good but they really do like i don't think that the storytelling has no. missed a beat so far quite frankly everything is just been yeah wild. absolutely and I, I don't think it is even just that the tension breaks i do think that those like you say the tiniest moments the simple bits of like back and forth dialogue between characters it's so human, it's so richly drawn, it feels so realistic. There's a bit, totally inconsequential moment where a couple of characters share a joke in a way that you just don't really hear characters joke in games very much. Like a totally, not a funny joke, not a trying too hard joke, just your everyday kind of banter nonsense. And it was just a thing like that in the middle of all this you know misery and horror as you say like that just connects you back constantly to yep these are real people this is a real situation you know yeah it, it does it makes it so real it makes it so real and i think that also that, that we don't often talk about the kind of performances mm. of voice actors but the voice actors of everyone like everyone including yep. ai has been fantastic what they say during combat man really really makes it sometimes it really really makes it and it really makes you think about what is actually happening Definitely, here yeah. you know it really is remarkable remarkable writing and i think uh, just incredible. just to add to that because we didn't really say it last week the game is just so stunningly beautiful particularly when you first start playing it is gorgeous and like th that effect wears off over time like when you've spent as long as we have now with the game but that first hour or two is like genuinely remarkable i think in terms of how it looks Looks. and also i can barely say anything about it because it will touch on so many spoilers but just the structure of the game i think is so well put together the way that the story progresses the way it jumps around from different place to place i literally think that's about as much as i can say on that but i think it is so clever it is so good at drawing you into what is a much broader world now than just joel and ellie's journey from the first game you know that felt very much like yeah, their story absolutely. and this feels like absolutely ellie's story but also a story of you know this collapse United States and what it's going through, you know? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, it's a much more fleshed out world now that 100% builds mm -hmm. on the first game, but is now just so much wider and deeper. It's It really is very impressive. And this week as well, PlayStation have come out and said that 
over 4 million units of The Last of Us Part 2 sold in three days, which makes it the fastest selling PS4 exclusive ever beating out Spider-Man that had 3.3 million. So I actually beat it out by yeah, quite a lot. Consider that Spider-Man and a Marvel game and all that, you know. Exactly. It's beating bloody Spider-Man. That's, I think that's very impressive. Very impressive indeed. To say that we are both enamoured with the game, I think would be a bit of an understatement. Definitely. <laughs> and with that, Lewis, I think it is time for the news. All right, news item number one. Crystal Dynamics, Lewis, have held a Marvel's Avengers, quotes, War Table live stream. This was to show off their multiplayer mode called Warzone, also the customization options within the game, of which there are plenty, a wee bit more of the story, and crucially, gameplay. Now, basically what I've come to discover about this game is that it is not the game that I want it to be. <laughs> this is very much a Destiny-esque games as service not story focused single player game like spider-man or say the arkham series were in terms of superhero games which i'm basically trying not to hold against it like i'm trying not to hold that bit against the game that it's just a game that probably isn't going to be for me but what is annoying about this is that i really want to like this game like i really really want to like this game i usually love superhero games when they land so for example the spider-man games was one of my favorite games of this generation and spider-man 2 on the ps2 remains one of my favorite games of all time absolutely yep. but what i will hold against this game is that it looks bad in almost every aspect i think <laughs> that visually it looks really really poor indeed considering that we're coming up to the end of a generation and we were just talking about how beautiful The Last of Us Part 2 looks, how good Ghost of Tsushima looked. Then we'll be moving on to the next gen. Everything that we've seen from the next gen looks absolutely astounding. This game's going to be a cross-gen title. It's going to be right at the end of this generation, right at the beginning of the next. I will have a free upgrade, which they did reiterate in the presentation. But I really just don't think that any of this has landed at all. Like, really, I don't think mm. that it has landed very well at all. And what I will say is that there's very much a split here because what I've read from various news outlets are either this now looks quite good, this now looks like something that I want to play in terms of a live service game, or this is nothing like what I want, this is not what I wanted from an Avengers game. Do you know what I mean? There, there does seem to be two yeah. separate paths there. I mean, I know what path you're on, but... Uh, <laughs> But as well for me, I don't think that this is the Avengers game that I wanted. I very much wanted a story-focused game, and that is really not, I think, what we're getting here. What we're probably getting here is a 12-hour story shoehorned into a service game that will probably fall a bit flat. I fear you're probably right about that, to be honest. Yeah, it's important to mention that there there is a story mode. They are talking about a single-player story mode, but... There is definitely 100% a story mode. But 100%. I do agree. It feels like that might be effectively your introduction, your extremely extended tutorial that then moves you towards playing online, playing multiplayer. Yeah. And see, when you see the gameplay and you contextualize it as a multiplayer game, as a live service game, I don't think that the gameplay looks as bad as people maybe made it out to be if you contextualize it like that. Because, and I think it was Venture Beat that said that it looks very much more like Marvel's Ultimate Alliance yeah. than it does like Marvel's Spider Man. Totally, yeah. That's been on my mind, that comparison. I hadn't actually read it anywhere, but when I watched this showcase, that kept coming into my head was is this just a sort of triple A, you know, fully 3D, big open world version of Marvel's Ultimate Alliance, you know? Sort of. I mean, that's certainly what it looks like to me. The, the combat for me does like nothing in, in the same way that the combat in Marvel's Ultimate Alliance did nothing for me. It looks so static. Mm. There, there doesn't, there's not anything dynamic about it. It looks like, oh, right, we're going to kill enemy one and then he dies and then kill them. We've moved on to enemy two and then I've hit him a few times with my Thor hammer or my big Hulk fist or whatever. Yeah. And then, okay, now he's dead and then we've moved on to the kind of other big robot thing which all look very generic in general and that's that's another thing about see the character models right okay moving off the fact that all the character models still look like cosplayers of disney's avengers right they all look like that but beyond that it just looks as if they've went oh let's get a generic white guy's face and what we're going to do is we're going to put long hair and a beard on him and then that'll be Thor and then we're going to put some dark hair and a slightly different beard on him and then that'll be Iron Man. Then we'll give this one like an army man haircut and some stubble and then he'll be Captain America. Then we'll make this one look a little bit older because he's supposed to be Eric Banner but is basically the same fucking face. And then the one woman or the one woman who is the, one of the original Avengers, Black Widow, 
will we do something interesting with her character? No, we will fucking not. We will load up generic white woman face yeah. and then we'll stick a ginger wig on her. The only person with any semblance of fucking character is Miss Marvel. And I think it is basically because she's not a generic white person. Yeah, and I know yeah. that, that's, that that almost sounds tokenistic and I definitely don't mean it that way. I just literally think that the bar's been set so fucking low by yeah. the rest of the other characters that by default almost she's the most interesting. And Modok as well, the, the bad guy, he had a bit of character because he had a gigantic fucking head. <laughs> that was it. That was all it was. The other bad guy as well, whose name I can't even remember, uh, the head of AIM, which is like the bad guy organization effectively again just looked like a nerdy version with generic white man face it was insane everything just looks so fucking bland totally so bland totally i mean yeah that goes for the gameplay as much as it does for the character models like you say it is interesting that miss marvel is the only one of the core characters that we've seen so far who wasn't a big part of the film franchise so it's the only thing that they've really feels to me that they've tried to create something from scratch because as we've said ages ago and as you kind of said there the core cast of avengers in this game look like to me look like cheap ripoffs of the core cast of the films yeah they look like npcs in any other game yeah just to go back to the gameplay like i watched that section of the thor gameplay that they showed at length and yeah, I, yeah. honestly i just thought it looked really boring it's like fly around a bit arc your way towards the big robot the, the it, flying bit was the only bit i thought looked quite good i actually thought that the flying mechanics looked cool apart from that the actual physical combat just absolutely did not yeah it looked so much like just spam square and you'll do your combo and then you know do your big finishing move kind of thing and just thinking about like how you were so passionate about the battle system in Final Fantasy 7 remake you know you yeah. could have had a squad of Avengers where you can switch between characters like that oh my you can god, set Lewis. up commands oh my god that's I've never even thought of that that's 100% what they should have done yeah totally oh my well, god they should have we'll done get that on the phone to them. <laughs> that is a 100 million dollar idea <laughs> right there list Square Enix if you're listening get us on the blower mate <laughs> yeah so what I was basically thinking about this game is beforehand I would have kind of been expecting the game to be like a 7.5 or an 8 out of 10 that's kind of the range mm-hmm. I was expecting it to be honestly I think that that could be a Anthem-esque 5 or 6 oh, like I God. really do I yeah, really but... think that people could respond very very badly to that when they got their hands on it yeah I, you can totally imagine that because it's got the fan base there and they know yeah. what they want and it might not exactly. be exactly yes. they know what they want it's a passionate fan base it's a as service game as well which notoriously have rocky technical issues at their launches do you know what I mean so if this goes off badly from an online perspective as well fuck me man that thing could fall flat in its face <laughs> All right, news item number two. CD Projekt Red has also done basically the same thing <laughs> called Night City Wire, which was a live stream taking a look at Cyberpunk 2077. Now, Lewis, let's talk about some fucking gameplay because that looked absolutely amazing. <laughs> oh, lordy, lordy, does it look good? It put a big, huge smile on my face. It looks like an absolutely fantastic, fantastic FPS with like a futuristic GTA Vice City. And then underneath all that, I know is going to be like the deepest RPG elements just underpinning it all. Honestly, this game was giving me fucking goosebumps looking at it because I wow, think that this game is almost made for me. Everything about this is like ticking my boxes. I'm really excited about it, man. I'm really, really excited about it. Good stuff. I mean, yeah, it's rare to hear you quite so passionate about something that we've not had hands-on time with yet. So I think I'm probably slightly colder towards it than that, but it does look, you know, the trailer that they put together for that and the gameplay that we saw was fantastic just this sense of scale in this game that we're starting to get a picture of i was reading some of the press comments around this reveal and i think there's been some hands-on time for some critics it just feels like there's so so much going on there's more environments than i realized there was there's like options right at the beginning about what type of personality you, you want to have which fundamentally alters how the game even begins apparently knowing what CD Projekt Red was able to do with The Witcher, which is so deep and so detailed and, you know, so incredibly strong on story and gameplay. If they can bring all that to this, to, like you said, a first-person shooter, to a kind of cyberpunk environment, it's going to tick so many boxes for a lot of people out there. Yeah, man, this is just so much more my jam, do you know what I mean? Like, see that kind of high fantasy aesthetic outside of Lord of the Rings? That doesn't really do much for me, whereas cyberpunk... 80s synth wave stuff <laughs> pink lights people with faces that can be changed it's, it's <laughs> mental it's crazy and i absolutely love it also it's a first person shooter which i'm quite into so <laughs> um just another couple of things that came out of the announcement they're also making an anime 
also right up my street list, called Cyberpunk Edge Runners, which apparently will be a completely standalone thing. And this is going to be in conjunction with Trigger Studios and anyone who doesn't know anything about anime, which I imagine is most of you. They also did Kill la Kill, which was a big, huge anime and very, very popular. And that will be coming to Netflix in 2022, so still quite a ways out. They also introduced in this episode Brain Dance, which Lewis, you'll be able to tell me here. I've heard that this looked a bit like a comparison to the Arkham Investigation mode. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually hadn't put those two things together necessarily, but it did make me think of the Batman the kind of detective mode, which was fleshed out particularly in Arkham Knight. So yeah, it's it looks very similar to that. It's essentially a mode wherein you can take full control of the environment as a scene plays out and you can kind of stop it and start it until you can find the clues that you're looking for. Essentially, that's kind of how it worked in Arkham Knight. And it looked, again, like more complex here in Cyberpunk, but it looked like it's going to be quite an important part of the gameplay experience. So I'm kind of keen to see how much variety they can bring to that. I'm keen to see how it ties in myself, I must admit. I don't know if this is going to be more side content than it is going to be like mainline story content, but it'll be very interesting to see how this ties in. I must admit, this is one of the few things in the trailer that I wasn't hugely keen on. Yep, I have to go along with it, yeah. But apparently it will be used more as a storytelling tool than anything, uh, so said the, the developers. The developers also said that as well that every character in the game has like a full backstory like they've written a full backstory for every single character wow. in the game like even if it's not used in the game itself they still have this enormous backstory for a lot of these characters that you might never know and also it was mentioned that the side quests so there will be no filler basically meaning that they're going down the Witcher line of uh, side quests, which was famous for having incredible side quests that were very, very important to the ma- to the mainline story and you were really missing out if you didn't do yeah. them. And that was in a world where we had Ubisoft and Assassin's Creed bloat. The Witcher was doing things very differently and quite a lot better. And as you mentioned, the media have got their hands on it now as well. And from what I can work out, it's just a few hours of gameplay. It just seems to be the intro to the mm-hmm. the game, basically. But I've honestly struggled to find a negative comment, and I genuinely mean that. I looked yeah. at quite a lot of articles. <laughs> there was one good Game Informer one that I'll post a link in the show notes over at players2.com, as always. But really, it was quite difficult to find criticism of it. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the most negative thing I saw was I mentioned that the the driving felt a little bit bland at the moment. And it's just like, well, that's probably something that just as the game goes on will change, you know, it depends see, where you are. Mate, see if the that. driving is the blandest part of yeah. that game. I'm okay with it. Exactly. <laughs> I'm absolutely fine. <laughs> All right, news item number three. The Harry Potter game is very real. This according to two anonymous sources at Avalanche Software, speaking to Jason Schreier over at Bloomberg. You might remember the Harry Potter game from leaked footage back in 2018, which showed a very, very early looking version of the build, like proper way pre-alpha stuff. Although the sources did say that that footage was authentic, most of the rumours surrounding it and kind of thereafter are not. But the game is definitely an RPG. It's definitely a game where you inhabit a student at Hogwarts, effectively. However, the sources did say that the team was uncomfortable that the management had not addressed J.K. Rowling's recent transphobic comments on Twitter. I don't know why, because they're very easy to condemn. But we won't go into the whole thing right here, but basically J.K. Rowling made some very, very stupid and unnecessary comments on Twitter relating to trans people. Subsequently, a lot of the other people associated with Harry Potter, including Daniel Radcliffe, Emma Watson, Rupert Grint and Eddie Redmayne, have all come out and said they fully support trans people and that she shouldn't have been saying stuff like this, effectively. (laughs) I mean, Eddie Redmayne specifically is famous for playing a trans woman in The Danish Girl. So yeah, that was all dumb. And the sources were very quick to point out that J.K. Rowling actually had very little direct involvement in the game it seems as well that the game was supposed to be announced at e3 however after that it all being cancelled it seems that there was a quotes roadmap shift with regards to the marketing whereby batman is now being announced in august apparently which we all kind of know it's going to be at this dc fandom event and then harry potter will be announced at a later date which is just as well for jk rowling because some people might have forgot about her by that point <laughs> Um, The game is still set to release in 2021 and is coming to next-gen consoles. Do you have any interest in this? I don't really know what your barometer is on this game. Yeah, I'm not sure either, to be honest. So we both grew up as Harry Potter fans. 100%, man. Fucking loved it. Still do, to be honest. I know that's a bit uncool to say these days, but (laughs) I really do love Harry Potter. I think basically I am interested in this this so much as I want to see it. I want to kind of know what it's about. I think basically... uh, 
well done Harry Potter RPG you know particularly one set in and around Hogwarts if you do that well it should be really good because the universe yeah. should be able to sustain a good RPG game that universe should be able to sustain it but yeah I'm not excited about it I don't think I guess that's where my final position would be like if we see this and it's looking good and it you know and it's been done in an interesting way and it hasn't basically that it's not a half-arsed licensed product which we you know there's a long history of those in gaming it less so these days though so you know there's a bit of hope there but um, i guess i'm on the fence that's probably where i'm landing yeah i suppose i'm probably on the fence as well maybe slightly more optimistic than you i mean mm. if this game looks good then i would definitely play it you mm. know i mean like I, this is definitely something that would be up my street I suppose we just have to wait and see it. I suppose we just have to wait and see it is the main thing. I think that that will really determine it. It will very quickly become obvious to any educated gamer whether this is just a throwing together RPG cash grab or yep. whether this is a serious attempt to make a great Harry Potter RPG. You know what I mean? I think outside of a few games, the Harry Potter franchise has been not treated well by video games no. <laughs> I think I would say so it would, be, it would be really good to see a good Harry Potter game you know I think a lot of people would be into it as well oh definitely that. I mean it'll sell like gangbusters even if it's rubbish but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, that is probably true all right news item number four there was a bit of a false rumour that there might be a new fable slash perfect dark announcement imminent However, this very much seems to not be the truth as it turns out. This all started by Tom Waring tweeting that the at Fable and at Perfect Dark game Twitter handles had registered accounts. However, Xbox's Alan Greenberg said, I know everyone is hungry for news, but sorry to get your hopes up. These accounts have been inactive for years. It's standard practice to secure our social handles for our IP, which, I mean, fair enough, that is very true. And as it transpires as well, the Perfect Dark Game account was actually a fan-made account. So it very much seems as though Xbox's next-gen first-party reveal that's supposed to be happening in July will not include Perfect Dark or Fable. This despite the fact that there have been rumours of a Fable game in development by Playground Games of Forza fame from all the way back in 2018. So, I suppose my question to you, Lewis, is... Outside of Halo and maybe a few Gears or Gears Tactics things here and there, are we just going to see a whole shitload of new IP from (laughs) Xbox in July? It seems likely, yeah. I mean, first of all, I think it's important to say they do need new IP. Like I, uh, I think I, I actually think that if they went down this road, and I think that them buying new studios is indicative of this as well, yeah. a burst of new IP. I feel that a lot of their IP is kind of stuck in that three sixty first person shooter yeah. stuff. You know what I mean? And it all feels a bit dated now. Whereas I think that this could actually be a great way to go for Xbox. Like I think that this might be a fantastic move if they are going down the road of no, these games were in the past like. It would be very difficult now to make a perfect dark game that held up to the high standards of that first one and make a Fable game that is going to meet fan expectations as well. Do you know what I mean? Although they, they do seem to be trying, the rumours here from Eurogamer back in 2018 do seem to suggest that there is going to be a Fable game yeah. coming at some point. But I actually think that a refresh of Xbox IP, getting some new IP in there could be a really great thing for them. I really do. Uh, d- definitely. I, th- I think the two things are needed there, though. So in terms of new IP, I think it's absolutely vital because I keep coming back to this question and it's one that I'm determined that we will talk about at length at some point, which is that for someone like me who's no interest in Halo... I don't know yet what that company is doing to make me want to buy an Xbox Series X because their big flagship thing that they're pinning the launch on at the moment is a game that I think for most people, if you're not already partly invested in Halo or have some interest in playing Halo, then you're not going to be turned on to Halo Infinite. I can't see many people suddenly picking up Halo Infinite who haven't played Halo before. But that doesn't mean to say that you throw out all the good stuff that you did have. And I would be stunned if there is no Fable game because I think fable can work i think it may be quite a different game now from what the oh, originals 100%. were I, I, fable I, I was just saying to you off air before we started this podcast is that outside of halo i think fable's probably the game that i would be most interested in playing totally from xbox ip i never got the chance to play the other fable games when they were first out because i was always over here on my playstation <laughs> but it was one that i genuinely feel that i missed out on like gears never really did it for me halo i always thought looked great and i always thought fable looked great as well and it is shocking to me quite frankly that it's been dormant for so long well exactly that so i accept that the kind of saying don't get excited about this twitter handle thing but i don't think that that also means that there is no fable game or even that we won't get an announcement about that you know in the next few 
three weeks when they have the showcase. I would still think. So you think they're playing this super coy? Is what you're. I, to I say. think they might be. I'm not. The perfect dark one is maybe less likely. It seems like that as a fan account. Although its first follower was the game's original creator, which I don't know. That rings a little bell for me. Unless he's sitting searching perfect dark every five minutes on Twitter. He may be. He may be. Maybe. <laughs> but the fable one, I feel like that might be more them saying what you've noticed happening on Twitter. Don't get too excited about that, but I don't think that that necessarily means that an announcement isn't coming. Because honestly, if they capped a big showcase with, oh, and one more thing, and they revealed a stunning new Fable game with all the advances that RPGs have taken over the years oh, since totally, those man. first That would be a jaw dropper. Yeah, yeah it would that, be incredible. That would be a real, real way to finish. Just FYI, on that Perfect Dark account, I believe that the, the fan that made it was at some point, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong on this, an Xbox employee, and yeah. they reached out to him. I think that's why he follows them. Interesting. Well, I don't know. There's a little bit of insider stuff going on there too. So, <laughs> I mean, it just it all speaks to like this Xbox showcase has got to it's got to do something. It's got to move something. I think it's got to really show why this console is important. You know? Yeah, I don't think that the last one, unfortunately, the kind of focusing on the third party stuff, really moved the needle for many people. No. Unfortunately, but. I think if Xbox knock this out of the park, then the race is on. Seriously, yeah. like the race is on. Like if they hit out with some great and new looking IP, the same way that PlayStation did, and then hit home some of these older IP that people still really crave, like your Halos, which I'm sure has to be there. You know what I mean? It absolutely has to be. And we need to get some proper information on it as well. Mm-hmm. And something like this, I mean, if something like this dropped in that presentation, that would be insane. That would be so, so good. And I think that they would really, really benefit from that. I really do. Definitely. All right, finishing off as we always do with a couple of shout outs. Shout out number one, first podcast of the month means free games. And on PlayStation Plus, you have NBA 2K20, Rise of the Tomb Raider and Erika. Erika is an FMV game. If you've never heard of it, look into it. It looks quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. Kind of caught my eye at E3 maybe a couple of years back now. And on Games with Gold, you have World Rally Championship 8, Dunk Lords, Saints Row 2, which is a 360 game, and Juju, which is a 360 game as well. Again, I'm pretty confident that Xbox have just fully given up with the Games <laughs> yeah. with Gold and given everything in any games pass, which, I mean, fair enough, because yeah. it is a sensational deal. All right, shout out number two. We mentioned on last week's show that Pokemon would be making another announcement. Uh, This was going to be on the Wednesday, which is very unfortunate for us because we were recording on the Tuesday and you would have heard that recording on the Thursday. So you would have already known that the game that was announced was neither Let's Go Johto or a Diamond and Pearl remake, both of which I would have been semi-happy with, but I definitely wanted that remake. And instead we got a Pokemon MOBA called Pokemon Unite, which basically seems like a Pokemon version of League of Legends. The game is going to be crossplay on Switch and mobile devices, um, iOS and Android. However, I don't think that anyone's going to play it because the video was downvoted 158,000 times on YouTube. Honestly, I don't know who this game is for. I do not know who was asking for it. They showed gameplay, quite a lot of it actually. I didn't think it looked particularly good or particularly interesting, but then again, I'm not into MOBAs. However, if you are and you're also interested in Pokemon, the game comes out on June the 24th. All right, shout out number three. Ubisoft have sort of a announced, sort of a leaked a new game. There was immense confusion around this. But the game is called Hyperscape. It has been developed by Ubisoft Montreal. And it is a free-to-play first-person battle royale, which will apparently go into closed beta next week at some point, apparently. And open beta in July with a console release coming later this year. This originally came from Rod Slasher Bearslaw on Twitter, who we quoted last week for the first time, and I said I didn't know who he was. Good guy, as it turns out. A good source for us, as it turns out. (laughs) Um, However, he said that the game was built very much with streamers in mind and was done in full partnership with Twitch. And apparently the Twitch chat will somehow directly impact the game live. Now, I know that that's been done before, but I don't think that it's been done on anything like this scale. So, first of all, I suppose, what do you think? Ubisoft are making another Battle Royale game. Feels like they're a bit late to the party. It does, yeah. I mean, it's hard to break into that sphere just now. Not not that it isn't worth trying, but it, it feels like it will have to be a pretty special game to catch attention, particularly when... You know, Valorant's just come out and taken a big chunk of the of the player base. You know, oh, yeah, Fortnite huge, still, still huge, it. yeah, absolutely. Maybe more interestingly, what do you think of the Twitch partnership slash integration? 
it's interesting. I can barely kind of get my head around what that might be. I hope that it doesn't compromise the game itself. To build a game with streamers in mind is interesting. Like, does that mean the game is weighted towards streamers? Like, if you're not a streamer, are you not going to have the same experience? If it's something where people watching along can shout things out or, you know, in some way affect the environment or give clues or something. I don't know. Like, I, I can barely imagine what that might be. It's an interesting concept, but I just hope it's not being done at the expense of people who aren't streaming kind of thing. It, cer- it certainly is. Like, what I would say is that I hope that someone who has a very very small following perhaps does not get destroyed by i don't know ninja or yeah. someone you know what i mean like i hope it doesn't weight the game in that way i hope it's not follower dependent but it'll be interesting to see how that pans out like that is legitimately interesting to me all right and just before we go for a break we just wanted to kind of acknowledge something before we moved on and that is that there has been a hell of a lot of truly horrendous accusations in the video game industry over the last maybe two weeks Just to name some of the bigger stories, Tommy Francoise and Maxime Belland, two high-profile higher-ups at Ubisoft, have been placed on administrative leave due to multiple sexual harassment and assault allegations. The Assassin's Creed Valhalla creative director, Ashram Ishmael, has stepped down from his role on the game uh, because of allegations that he lied about his personal life, namely that he lied that he was married in order to start up relationships with other women. Chris Avalon, a prominent game writer as well, has received multiple public accusations of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And then even Mitch Dyer and Kaylee Plagg talking about a toxic work environment over their time at IGN, particularly under Tal Blevins and Steve Butts, including forcing Dyer to effectively publish lies as news. Also worth pointing out that Butts has also been accused of sexual harassment in the past. And we just wanted to acknowledge this. We just wanted to say that we know that this is happening. We are definitely aware of this situation and that we very much feel as if this is a bit of a Me Too moment for the video games industry. I think I speak for both of us and Lewis. Please chime in if I'm not. But we very much applaud the bravery of these people coming forward. We definitely applaud them holding abusers accountable. I would also like to say that this is not about cancelling quotes anyone, a term that I fucking despise and is 100% about holding these people accountable. Our default position now and always will be is to listen to and to believe victims in all of these situations 100% without doubt. These people absolutely do not deserve harassment in any capacity. They are making the video games industry a better place for us all and are quite frankly out in people who we don't need and don't want. Yep, I completely agree with that, Mark. As ever, I feel like we just need to say, like, be better. You know, we can all be better. We can all treat each other with respect. And that's the only thing that matters. Be good to one another. Time for a beer. And then we'll be back with Topic of the Week. And we are back with Topic of the Week. Topic of the Week this week is our play along of Volume. Volume is our second Mike Bithel game after Thomas was alone. And at its core... Volume is a stealth puzzle game that takes the vast, vast, vast majority of its inspiration from the VR missions from the first Metal Gear Solid game, if anyone can remember that far back. Um, So much so that Hideo Kojima was actually given a special thanks in the credits. This game was made for somewhere around £30,000, which, considering how the game turned out, I think is actually yeah, very impressive indeed. Definitely, yeah. Uh, good use of the money. However, Mike Bithel himself actually hospitalised himself by overworking this game, which is not good at all. Definitely not good. And it probably highlights a big problem with indie development <laughs> and how much work you have to get done by yourself. However, Lewis, getting straight into it, Well, we'll start with the story. The game is essentially a modern retelling of the Robin Hood legend, or a kind of spin on the Robin Hood legend, we will say. You play as Robert Loxley, a play on Robin Hood, whose first real name is Robert and is from the town of Loxley. And your main enemy in the game is Guy Gisborne, again, a spin on Sir Guy of Gisborne, who is in the Robin Hood legend, and your helpful AI called Alan, who has nothing to do with Robin Hood. (laughs) However, Bithel did describe Alan as the Microsoft Office paperclip as a military training program, which I thought was quite interesting. (laughs) So these are your three main characters, effectively. Robert Loxley is played by Charlie McDonald. Guy Gisborne is played by Andy Serkis. Somehow Mike Bithel managed to get Andy Serkis to voice his indie game, which is incredible. And the AI Alan is played by Danny Wallace, who was the narrator from Thomas Was Alone. 
The main premise of the game is that an evil corporation has taken over England and is now under an authoritarian dictatorship. Robert gains access to a device called a volume, which allows him to simulate real-life spaces in VR, effectively, and allows him to simulate heists. Robert is a thief, and Robert uses the volume to simulate heists against Gisborne and other high-profile targets, and live-stream these on the internet in the same vein as a Let's Play video, I suppose, aided by Alan, who is the volume's AI. This then encourages real people to carry out these heists in the real world to hurt Gisborne, and this is effectively the game taking from the rich and giving to the poor. The game kind of does deal with the morality around that situation a little bit, and I suppose that is the real crux of the story in this game, because this game, I would say, is much more gameplay and mechanics focused than is story focused than a lot of the other games that we've done in this, which have been very, very, very heavily story focused and a lot less gameplay focused, you know? Yeah, it's definitely one where the the kind of point that the game is making is sort of made through how you play it rather than... It does have layers and layers of the story that gets introduced at different points, which I found a little messy in certain places, but I guess we'll come on to that. But overall, it's all about how the stealth kind of puzzle gameplay feels. That's the kind of main crux yeah, of all this. Yeah, ab- absolutely. But well, let's, let's just stick with the story then and... I would say that most of the story is given out through documents that you find in game. Effectively, is that fair to say? Between those documents and the bits of dialogue that you get, either small from bits of Alan dialogue between Gisborne, the characters, yeah. yeah, which come maybe every ten levels or so. Roughly, you, speaking, may, you yeah. might say, and there's there's a hundred levels in the game, so the dialogue is relatively limited. So that's interesting that you say the story is messy, though. How 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 would you say that it comes across messy? I guess, I mean, it's, it feels messily told in certain respects. It's not a messy story. There's so much of it that's scattered around, like you say, in documents that you don't actually have to pick up necessarily. Although I think most gamers would tend to, if you encounter something like that, you're going to pick it up and give it a quick skim. But there's that, there's the dialogue that you do get over certain levels, which, I mean, quite literally at times I found was either overbearing the action, like I was trying to just play the game and this was going on on the bottom of the screen because it comes up with the subtitles as well as um, having it vocally so there's a dialogue box that comes up with yeah. like the, a characterization of the of, of each character yeah which i would say covers far too much of the screen way too because much. it gets in the way of the gameplay <laughs> yeah so exactly that and then the third kind of way that so each level before you start it there's like a, a two sentence blurb about what you're doing so it might be like this one is about breaking into the judge's house and doing this or that the next thing and yeah, honestly yeah. like i felt that those were almost too easy to just completely ignore so you could kind of goes through the game not really understanding what it is that you're doing level by level within the oh, within the man, story I, world. I'm not sure about that. I think you've done a wee, yourself a wee bit of a disservice there if you've not been reading those uh, as you kind of went through the game. You know, I mean, I, th- I thought they were great. I thought they really contextualised what you were supposed to be doing, and it wasn't just a VR room. Do you know what I mean? This room did represent something, and you had a real objective here you know what I mean I I mean I agree that that's what it's trying to do I just don't I did read them all don't get me wrong but like I could barely tell you what any of them were now like what is happening in each game room so to speak isn't actually all that important like it doesn't matter if you're stealing from the judge and you're trying to steal some particular document or if you're stealing from the deposed queen and all of that is just kind of padding around the broader mythology which is which I think doing a modern or almost like a slightly futuristic retail of Robin Hood within gaming is an interesting idea and it is overall an interesting story. I would say that I, I kind of agree with you that the the way that it's told is disparate but I do actually think that the story in and of itself despite being a, a much smaller part of the game I, I definitely did value it though like yeah. I definitely thought that it was I was definitely glad for it being there 100% but Lewis moving on to the crux of the game the gameplay so in each level and as we said there was a hundred levels Each level sees you having to collect a certain number of items and escape, effectively, and avoid enemies. All basic stealth stuff. However, in each level, particularly as the game progresses, you start to be given specific abilities, whether that ability is offensive and you can stun an enemy, or you can project an image of yourself running away to distract an enemy, or whatever. It began to feel, to me like it was more of a puzzle actually than a stealth game or certainly more of a puzzle than a modern stealth game it definitely felt like those old school stealth games like the vr missions 
in Metal Gear Solid, which the game is heavily based. And it felt as if it was done really, really well. Like, I really enjoyed the stealth puzzle aspect of it all more than I perhaps thought that I would to be completely honest with you. I wasn't massively keen on this one in particular like I really really wanted to play Thomas Was Alone and we've started doing a thing where we would play like a couple of games from like a really high profile indie dev or an indie dev studio and I thought well okay cool we'll put volume in this as well I know that Lewis has played it, he says it's good so maybe I'll like it as well and it really surprised me, like it really surprised me how much fun I had to play in the game I really did think it was good fun I'm glad to hear that, yeah. My kind of history with the game is that I got it more or less at release, which was like in 2015. 2015, yep. Yeah, because I just saw a load of reviews about it and features just before it came out, particularly drawing the comparison to those VR missions from Metal Gear Solid 1, which, you know, I adored. I'm sure you adored. Like I loved, but I think in my stupid brain back in 2015, I was thinking, oh, this is some stupid ripoff. For me, there was just like a bit of excitement there about cause even the fact that like the game's cover art is heavily inspired by the Metal Gear Solid art even though the end game art isn't really that much like it at all so I jumped in back then I played 60% of the game because you know that because there's 100 levels and I just had to kind of come back and finish it a few years later and I only fell off because there is a certain amount of kind of repetitiveness about it each level is obviously poses a new challenge but I think you put it really well when you say that each one is almost like a little kind of stealth puzzle where you sort of just have to work out what order you have to do things where which routes you have to take to get round different guards or different cameras or whatever to get to your end point and it's kind of just about quite quickly or as quickly as you can working out what the steps are to take I need this device to get in this bit so I'm going to have to go up here first to get it and that's the kind of core loop essentially exactly and and, and everything's timed as well I suppose that's you're probably trying to get through it as quickly as possible which the game does cleverly just simply by putting a clock in it yeah you know absolutely what I mean? yeah but this is a situation where not having dynamic gameplay and having very structured gameplay really lends itself very well to what the game is trying to do, really lends itself very well to the old school stealth puzzler, like in the the vein of those VR missions. I honestly thought that it was great. I don't really have very much to say in terms of something profound about the gameplay <laughs> other than it's really fun. It's yeah. really fun and mechanically it's tight. It feels good. I thought that it might have felt a little bit sloppy, honestly, just because it's an indie title, but it doesn't. It feels really, really good and really, really tight. In terms of the visual as well, outside of the cutscenes, which I thought was a bit rough by yeah. today's standards, but actual in-game and playing, like I, I think that the, the art style that they've chose, which is also very VR-looking and very VR missions from Metal Gear Solid-looking, I suppose, it really lended itself well, really looked good, really looked sharp for what it was trying to go for, you know? Yeah, in that sense, it's quite a stylish game, and you're you're absolutely right about like it could have been sloppy, and to get stealth right in any game, I think is probably quite tricky because there's a lot to it, and players come into it with a lot of expectations, and that's the thing that I really did enjoy about it is that it does that good thing that a really good stealth game or a really good puzzle game, and I would say this about games that I've played recently like Baba Zoo or the Talos Principle, you find a flow state eventually with it you almost see the whole solution at once and you kind of move through the level following that when I was doing the, the final kind of 20 level say having taken a big break from it and working my way through the last 40 by the time I'd kind of got used to the, the controls and the mechanics again I just felt like I was dancing through levels at points and that's so good when doing that still means that you're being stealthy you know it's not like I'm just running about mad and trying to get to the end point before anyone manages to kill no, it's me it's very calculated yeah, and it has to be it, has it, to be. it absolutely has to be and so you're constantly like ducking into this corner doing your little whistle move watching which way they go to go in the opposite direction you know it's it's so cleverly done like that and i would say in contrast to thomas it was alone which was so story driven and the, and the story and the narration and the gameplay all dovetailed so well i think that you could play volume without any of all that stuff if someone just said to you here's 100 sort of puzzle box levels on you go i think you would have a similar level of fun with this which speaks to how good that gameplay it can be yeah no it's great and i have to say as well like some of the level design wonderful like really properly top-notch level design Hideo kojima would be proud i would say <laughs> I suppose some of the negatives of the game that we've kind of got to come on to, I suppose. The dialogue, what were your thoughts on that? Because I know that you were critical of yeah. Danny Wallace and Thomas was alone, so he's now back and there's more. So. <laughs> back with more. Yeah, I mean, again, probably one of my least favourite things about the game, to be totally honest. I honestly thought that Robert's performance and I know that the guy, Charlie McDonnell, who 
did the voice of Robert wasn't like a professional voice actor. I think he was like a YouTuber yeah, back in the day, so, and, now yeah. and now he's a, a filmmaker or something like that. Which I mean, I mean, fair play to the guy, but his performance wasn't great. Honestly, that felt very, very flat to me. I did not mind Danny Wallace in the slightest. Andy Circus was great. Obviously, he's Andy Circus. <laughs> But I really think that Robert fell really quite flat indeed for me, and he is most of the dialogue. Yeah, or a fair, fair chunk of it. I mean, to me, the issue was less so much the individual performances, but again, kind of like with Thomas Was Alone, I feel like there's just a slight level of polish kind of missing from these two Mike Bithell games, where things like if you quite quickly, you know, if there's dialogue at the start of a level and you die quite quickly at the start of a level, it often begins that dialogue again and again. Again well, and again. Each box is replayed, so unless the dialogue box is finished and you move on to the next one, it will replay that dialogue box infinitely. Yeah, I just don't love that. I think that, that a lot of games have found ways to get round replaying the same content at you that it should know that you've already heard or seen or whatever. So for yeah. me. This is 2015, though, and an indie game, so I can kind of I mean, forgive it for stuff like that's that. That's the thing, know? like, it's not a massive criticism, and like you say, it's an indie game, so you there's a certain amount that you forgive, but it just, between that and, like, the extremely loud you've been caught sound... Oh, Lewis, I'm so glad you brought this up. It's painful. Oh, my God, that music is one of the most annoying things about this entire game. Yeah. The you've been caught music... As opposed to like the Metal Gear music that is a very clear note, is that whoop, yep. you know what I mean? That you hear every single time you get caught and it's so iconic now, of course. But in this, it's like a swell of orchestral music, which in itself doesn't sound bad, but when you experience it a lot over and over, over and over it is one of the most grating yeah. pieces of music in a video game that i think i have ever experienced so i'm kind of glad that we agree on the negatives i suppose <laughs> <laughs> one of the other things that really really frustrated me is that all the abilities are on a timer which is fine absolutely nothing wrong with that they're put on a timer because they, they don't want you spamming the game yeah but when you die oh my god why my. does that timer not reset why does it then make you wait another 10 to 12 seconds before you can use that ability again because that's the next thing you need to do is you use that ability exactly that is a wild is wild design decision for me absolutely wild the most frustrating thing about the entire experience of playing this game is when you die because you misuse the tool that you have and you know what you're actually supposed to do and then it fucking makes you wait every time and so you immediately run out in front of the guy because it hasn't loaded in time it's so frustrating I totally agree with that and that happens often because the more difficult parts of the levels hinge on using these abilities correctly do you mm-hmm. know what I mean and if it goes wrong it goes wrong and then you get caught and you die and you need to start again and in the world of Super Meat Boy and Celeste and Instant Respawn which this game has basically yeah I do not understand why that doesn't reset just immediately. I really don't. I I agree. That was really, really frustrating. The other negative I would say about this game, the lasers fucking suck. Yeah, it's so hard to tell where they are in relation to to the player model. Initially, I was getting so, so frustrated is because I kept on walking under the lasers. So you can't crouch or anything in this game. So you have to judge it so that it's above your head when you walk past. But there's really no barometer for that at all. Like, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to decipher when the laser is just above your head and you have optimal time to walk under them. So yeah, they they were frustrating. So I'm very glad that we agree on all the negatives (laughs) at least. (laughs) But despite that, despite that, I wouldn't let any of those things stop anyone playing the game because it was really good fun. Like I really genuinely did enjoy playing it. I really, really enjoyed playing it and I would actually recommend it to anyone and it surprised me about how much I liked it. Just a final mention, I just wanted to say as well that there is a user creation tool in the game as well. And by all accounts, some of the user-made levels are absolutely fantastic. I have unfortunately dabbled in none of them, but I, it's great that that's there and it was great that there was a community even back in the day that, that did that and produced a lot of additional content for this game because, as you said, Lewis, like, even without commentary, even without any of the story beats, just playing through these levels is damn good fun. So if there's an near infinite amount of levels out there user created or otherwise i noticed that there was some curation on there as well like dev selected levels here and there i just think that's great i just think that was a really nice really nice touch you know yeah and great to see that the community for the game seemed to engage with that like people were making their own levels certainly back at launch at least so 
you know, you can tell that people got really engaged with what the game was trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Any final thoughts? I mean, I'd just like to say, as you did, like, I did really enjoy it as well. Like, it has its flaws, certainly. The same as I felt with Thomas was alone. Like, it has a few areas that I would have liked to see seen tightened up, but that, as you put it yourself, like, it's an indie game. It's now a five-year-old indie game. It does a lot of things very well. And if any of these small things bother you while you're playing it, I think you'll kind of get past it because the experience of solving each room as you go along is kind of satisfying enough as it is. I wish it was a Switch game because then that user-generated content would be so perfect to just keep going with it. 100%. I, t- I totally agree as well. Like, Don't let any of the negatives that we just said put you off playing it. Yeah, it, it was great fun, and I would yeah. recommend that anyone played it. There, There is annoyances here there. It's, it's nothing major. It's nothing major. It's nothing that should put you off playing the game. It was great fun, and I'm actually really glad that we decided to play it. Good, good. I'm, uh, yeah, after all this time, I'm glad you took it on as well, yeah. All right, Lewis, I think we'll need to call it a day there. I'd like to remind everyone that you can find players too on all the social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, it really, really, really helps us out. While you're over there as well, if you could give us a little review, again, it just helps us out even more. And thank you so, so much to anyone that's already done that for us. It really does just take you five seconds and it means a whole lot to us. So if you could take that five seconds, you'd be really helping us out and you would be an absolute legend to us. And now it is time to announce our game for July, which will be Bastion by Super Giant Games. This is a game that I've been excited to play for a very, very long time, and I bought it on Steam a very, very long time ago. <laughs> it's currently sitting on a Steam sale for £2.27. So for God's sake, ladies and gentlemen, you have no excuse whatsoever <laughs> not to play along with us for £2.27 for what, by all accounts, is an absolutely fantastic game. And just so everyone knows as well, in August we will again be playing another super giant game called Transistor, which immediately followed Bastion, which is also right now going on Steam for three pounds and nine pence. So for the next two months, you have got no excuse, no excuse <laughs> whatsoever. Both games are relatively short, from what I can work out, they're kind of between five and seven hours, I would say. Both are supposed to be absolutely fantastic, and both I've been looking forward to playing for a very, very long time. This is actually super exciting for me. They've been on the list for a long, Good long stuff. time. Good stuff. Nice. I can't say I've kind of had the same length of excitement for it, but I think it's going to be really cool. Bastion sounds like a really interesting game. For those prices, like you say, hard to deny it's going to be worth playing. So good stuff. If you hate it, it's only £2.27. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week. Thanks. (laughs) 